Hello and welcome back to the Pulse of Spokane. I'm your host, Ryan Meza, and I'm joined with the one and only Kent <laughs> Adams. You know, you all know Kent. Um, we are also joined here with Michael Cathcart from the City Council. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yes, I appreciate of, it. Yes, of course. So I think we're just going to get right into it. I know we have a lot of things we want to talk about. Yeah, um, a lot of big issues going on. Yes, yeah. most definitely. And I'm glad you're here, um, especially right now during this time with the pandemic and all the protests happening throughout Spokane, sure. um, especially with um, police funding and reform. Um, what are some issues you guys are trying to implement um, with that? Yeah, well, again, thank you so much for, for having me on. And I think it's been, gosh, almost a year since I've, I've been on, uh, probably since kind of campaign season last year when I was, I was seeking this office and fortunate enough and to- And I thought it was something I said, that well, why you don't show up. And then, and then you use the excuse of the pandemic. I mean, come on, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to what have you What are you going to do? I, yes. I, I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, big issues right now that we're right in the midst of discussing. Um, and, and you're right, you brought up the protests and, and I do want to say, you know, there was a big protest uh, just a few days ago and I was so incredibly grateful that there was no violence, nothing yes. negative came out of that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, with a lot of concerns that were out there sharing their, their thoughts. Um, we obviously have seen some violence and, and some, some, I guess call it rioting uh, in the past uh, in Spokane as well as many other communities. And so, you know, there were a lot of concerns and um, I think our, our police department was prepared, but fortunately didn't really have to act. So it was it was really good. Uh, so I was really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for the for the leadership of the organizers of, of the recent um, uh, protests. So um, but in kind of relation to that, there is obviously a lot of discussion ongoing right now regarding uh, the police department and changes and reform. And, you know, there are very strong across the nation, very strong calls to defund police and an idea that I, I do not support uh, at all. Um, but in Spokane, I think, you know, we've taken a different tact. Our, our mayor has, has very, you know, fortunately been uh, a very strong uh, supporter of our police department. She's done a great job. Mm -hmm. And they have been able to implement uh, going forward a reform conversation with the city council. Um, and I've got colleagues on the council that, that have some reforms they really want to implement. But we've been able to, I think, kind of hold back a little bit, have more discussion, more, a more thoughtful process, which I'm very grateful for. And there is a, at present a, um, a list of, and I can't officially release this, this isn't mine to release, but there are about 29 uh, proposed reforms at this point in time. And there could be a couple more, a couple less when this final document is done. And it may be released anytime in the next week or two uh, to the public to take a look at. Um, and it includes a number of things that have been in the public eye and we've talked about, such as uh, regulating the use of, of canines for policing, mm -hmm. uh, eliminating things like tear gas and rubber bullets. And in the case of a, a, a community policing, you know, in like a riot type situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a, a number of smaller things, you know, additional trainings and um, uh, a big one that's a conversation now ongoing around the country. And, and Colorado actually did this which is eliminating qualified immunity. So taking away the protection that officers have okay. uh, in the course of their job. And so there's just all of these issues are gonna come forward and we're gonna be talking about them and we're gonna do so under this agreement kind of with a lens of just a whole host of things. So it could be things like a, a racial equity lens, it could be a community safety lens. Um, one that I thought was missing from an original draft of this that I've been told is gonna be added um, um, after I've pushed for it is to add the consideration for, for victims and, and mm -hmm. what impacts victims face in, in criminal justice and, and law enforcement and policing. So I think that's really important. I'm very grateful that, that both the council president and the mayor have uh, seen fit to include that consideration in, in a, a new draft that will be coming out of this document. But as we look at these issues, you know, I have said over and over again, I want a lot of discussion, I want a lot of knowledge, and I want to talk to the folks that are on the front lines doing these jobs every day. And so kind of through this, I have gone out and had the opportunity to uh, speak to our, our police leadership uh, twice. And I've been told that no other council member, frankly, in the history of the council has ever gone out and spoken to police leadership. Uh, wow. And so I'm, I was very eternally grateful to Chief Meidel, who, who allowed me that opportunity twice to come out mm -hmm. and do so. I asked a number of these questions about reforms and got feedback directly from those officers. Uh, I've also done four ride-alongs in the last, I think, eight weeks probably now. Uh, I've got two more coming up in the next month that I'm going to do. 
And one of those with, was with a canine unit, Officer Buckman and, and his dog, uh, Trace. And that mm -hmm. was a, yeah. a really great experience. They are, he is so knowledgeable and that is such a wonderful dog. Yeah, and Trace is amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. Have you, have you had uh -huh, the opportunity? I have, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, great story too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I had a wonderful time going out with them. Uh, and I try to do full shifts when I can, cause I want to experience what they experience. Uh, I don't, I'm not interested in cutting it short. You know, if they're going to be out for 10 hours, I'd be out for 10 hours. I just, I want to have that full experience. And so I've done a downtown, I've done a couple South Hill shifts, North side. I mean, I'm just trying to experience, you know, the whole thing. And uh, I've got a couple more ride alongs coming up with, with actually newer, younger officers, mm -hmm. uh, because okay. I want their perspectives, you know, yes. they don't have all the, the history or maybe baggage. And so I want to see what, what they see and how, how they feel about things. Um, and I'll tell you one, one thing that came to my attention uh, after riding with a younger officer is the idea of um, just the impacts on, on your uh, psychology of yeah. being out there. And not all officers, you know, make it a routine basis to, to you know, go see a therapist and talk about the issues that they experience. Um, but some of the younger officers do, and it's not something they see as beneath them. And so I, I think that was a, a really eye-opening thing to me and something we should be talking about as part of this process. Uh, so I've just been very uh, diligent, I think, in trying to get all the facts. I went and saw a canine demonstration. I saw the lateral neck restraint demonstration. Uh, I went out and experienced their Vertra, which is a, a virtual simulator. Mm -hmm. A little aged now. We're, we're trying to upgrade it to a new system. Uh, but, you know, there's just all these things that I think you have to do to make, you know, really uh, good decisions regarding policing, as well as taking into mind what the community wants and their needs. and. I'll tell you, I went out last year and I knocked on 8,000 doors as I campaigned for this office. And I spoke to a lot of people, not one person in all that. And I was knocking on doors of, of all sides of the political fence. Not one person told me they wanted to defund police, eliminate police, disband mm -hmm. police. That conversation never once came up. There were certainly people that wanted more oversight and I am very strongly committed to more oversight in policing. I think that is really, really critical thing that we have to do. And I think it solves a lot of the issues that many folks in the community want to try to solve with 29 different reforms. And I think we can solve quite a few of them with more oversight, which is why I'm deeply committed to that. Uh, but the thing that they all said to me, or I would say the vast majority said to me, was they wanted to feel safer in their neighborhoods. Yes. And so I think one thing that's still missing from this that I'm still pushing for is to include um, you know, real people and, and neighborhoods in this process of discussion. I think we need to hear mm -hmm. their points of view and yeah. find out what they think. Um, and I think if we can make our neighborhood safer, we can be quicker to address crime houses and drug houses, which believe me are prevalent in our community, sadly yeah. enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to make for a safer community. And, and frankly, I think everybody is going to find uh, just a, a much, you know, improved situation for our Spokane community if yeah. we do that. Um, I'm concerned yeah. because a lot of this negative and the discussion about defunding and changing almost over to a, a social welfare system, yeah. that kind of thing, that's coming from some protesters, rioters, and from the majority of the city council. Those are all left-wing folks, okay? You, you're the only reasonable person <laughs> on our city council. I, and I say that honestly, and there would be thousands that would line up behind me. You know that. Where is this all coming from? Because it, it, it isn't that bad out there. Our police are not killing people, especially in Spokane. Yes, once in a while. I'll tell you because I've talked to and I know a lot and you know a lot of uh, uh, policemen, the, 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 the uh, uh, sheriff and the and, uh, police chief and so forth. Yes, there are a few bad apples. There are in any profession. Absolutely. Okay. And the first people that don't like that are those in the profession. And they'll, they're the ones that scream. They the want louders. to root it out. They, they want to. Absolutely. Yeah. And mistakes happen. Okay. I get that. But mm -hmm. when you see where's been all the attention across the country, yeah. we're moving out of Spokane now to across the country in terms of the police that are getting shot in the head. They're, you know what I mean? Uh, it, yeah. I, I just, I think we're overdoing it. And I'm, me, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking sure. about the rest of the council because what they want to do is social justice and sure. all of that, not deal with the real issues. Because some of the things that you were talking about, and you didn't go over, I know most of them, 
But I'm really concerned out there that we've got a very left wing, and, and I wanted to sit in on this because I could say this, and he can be nice, <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I can say this because we had an opportunity last fall. We elected one conservative, right-thinking person. But the rest of the council are bozos. I'm sorry, and I'll stand by that. Well, let me, let me say a couple of things just to yes. address your, your yes. concerns. I will say I'm, I'm very happy to see that I, I believe all or at least most of the council has agreed to sort of this process to work with the mayor and slow it down and be thoughtful in consideration in terms Do of Do you think it'll be that way all the way through, though? I don't know. Okay. I hope so. Okay. Yeah. I, I certainly okay. have some strong disagreements. Because I, I'd back you on that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If, if they're reasonable. Yeah. But there's some re unreasonable things that they've I, proposed, at least publicly. And let me say, to say this. Um, I believe all, but perhaps one member of the council has said that they don't support defunding police. Um, and so, uh, you know, I try to take them at their word that that's yeah. true. Uh, but there's a couple things that concern me with that. One is that we have, uh, we just, on recently this week, we deferred a consideration of $115,000 that the police had asked for money that's already there, that, that that's allocated there. And, and how they got that money, there are some concerns, and I share those concerns, but the money's there. And they want to use it for some additional safety measures and trainings. And unfortunately, it was indefinitely deferred. And so, but I, I've been promised it's that would come be back. safe for the policemen. It would increase some safety things like um, uh, it would it would provide them with like uh, some additional I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, a dart type thing where if there's a police chase, they can actually throw a dart onto the car so that they don't have to, to chase that car. Okay, sure. They can locate it later on. Right, right. Right. A there's, tracking device, essentially. Yeah. There's some, some trainings for um, some, some additional police trainings. I, I can't remember. I think it's um, regarding human trafficking. And there's some additional equipment for like night vision goggles. So, for example, I mean, it could be anything that they use it for. If there's a bad guy in a neighborhood hiding in somebody behind somebody's house where that now family is at risk, these officers can put these goggles on and it's like perfect daylight. They can see that bad guy. He yeah. can't see them. Yeah. And that's a safety improvement yes. mm -hmm. uh, for the community. Um, and so there's just a number of things like that that I think, you know, I have no problem with those expenditures. But put off indefinitely. Put off indefinitely. I've been promised it's going to come back soon, okay. but, but it is indefinitely at this time. Uh, and so, so certainly that's, uh, that's a concern. Another is, you know, last year, and I opposed it, I think I've been very public about opposing it, we passed a public levy, a uh, safety levy to raise dollars for public safety. Yes. And I believe a majority of the community said they wanted those dollars, uh, the, the, the portion of it for, for law enforcement, to go to law enforcement. And as part of this agenda uh, discussion is the idea of actually using some of that to hire uh, behavioral health specialists instead of officers. Now, don't get me wrong. I strongly support our behavioral health unit. Yes. I think it is it is wildly successful. And they ride along with the they ride police. along right. with yes. the officers. I've heard nothing but good things. It, it is amazing. Yes. It's a great program, and I and I fully support hiring more of them. But I think we need to find the dollars from somewhere other than that levy because yes. I think that levy was approved specifically yes. for yes. in the minds of the community hiring yes. more officers. You're right. So that to me as someone who voted for it. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And I voted against it because I didn't think it would actually go to hiring more officers. And okay, so we are right, <laughs> maybe. So. so, so that's my my concern there. Fully support it, but we need to find the money. Yeah. I think somewhere else to to do that appropriately. Um, and so, I, you know, I I think that uh, as far as where it's coming from, there are certainly some some activists who have done a really good job of organizing and communicating with the the council, the administration, the community at large that. You know they want to take money away from policing and use it somewhere else yes um and i just i don't agree with that yeah. I, I think you know if we want to use money somewhere else we need to find the money somewhere else to do that not take it away from from policing which frankly i believe we already have about 50 fewer officers at least that we need and my big priority is neighborhood policing i yes. want to get to a neighborhood policing model where we can have officers on the street engaging um, our community members you know directly find, seeing you know, things that are maybe out of place. Um, and, and I think that would create actually a more safer and friendlier atmosphere between the community and police, you uh, know? And, and I, yeah. so that to me is the big priority and the big reform I would support uh, right away. And every conversation I've had with, with officers, they all support it. They don't know how to pay for it. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. that's a big question mark, Right. but they all support the concept. Yeah. I think back to about six years or so ago, when I was helping Jeff Holy run for office and he, and he was talking about, we need to make our streets safer. Yes, that's police language. 
we need to make our neighborhoods safer because I live in a neighborhood. My wife and son live in a neighborhood. My grandkids and my kids live in their neighborhoods. Sure. Yes, we want the streets safe. We don't want people going yeah. drunk driving and all that. And I, I get that. But we want our neighborhoods safe. And that's what it comes down to. When I hear from people, and I believe me, I hear it, that yeah. they won't even let their kids play in the front yard anymore. Uh, that, that to me is like, okay, let's do something different. Let's do absolutely, different. absolutely. So that's a concern, absolutely. I know, even just like your comment with the bad apples and everything. Yes, there are definitely some bad apples out there, and, and that's why we need the oversight. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. you have them at GU. Some some uh -huh. professors probably you probably had it in high school. Mm -hmm. We all have experienced those, and you know who they are. But sometimes exactly. it's tough to get sure. get them out of sure. there and so forth. And there are union issues too that there yes, are obstacles that get in the way. And, yes, uh, and so yeah, but but no, you're right. We we need to find ways to improve. Uh, uh, things on the personnel side. Yeah. yeah, even like with the night vision goggles, you're saying like that can definitely help safety reasons yeah. with just yeah. not like maybe getting the right person instead of the wrong person in sure. like a certain situation during yeah. the nighttime. Yeah. And my thing is with police officers, once they put on that uniform, they're already given a stereotype. But once yes. they take off that badge and everything, they're their dad, their mother, their sister, their brother. It's um, good point. Good it's point. definitely yeah. just yes. a situation that yes, I I do agree that there is some social justice and some education that needs to be involved. Uh, maybe yeah. that money could be used for is education and learning more about different cultures and diversity and inclusion and in areas like that. I think that's what most of these protests are doing. It's just giving people knowledge and hearing other people's stories. I know I've seen Nadine and the chief of police out there um, listening to these stories. Once yeah. the riots started happening and started kind of becoming more peaceful, um, they were out there listening to these stories and wanting to hopefully implement those changes. So hopefully these 29 Absolutely. reforms can kind of implement, yes, more safety reasons, just like with goggles or maybe detecting um, just like a GPS device, yeah. just to, like keep the officers safer, but also being able to implement the other side um, I know it's hard to keep everyone happy. Yeah. Obviously, well, like, you're you know, not going to make everyone happy. And if you're trying to make everyone happy, you're going to fail you yeah. know, across the board, right? Exactly. Fail so, everybody at that point. That's, that's really that's right. Yes. That education piece but of I, it and that inclusion I will and diversity. Tell you, there are some reforms in here I absolutely support uh, and I think are good. Um, but I but I have said since day one that if we're going to do these reforms, we need to do it through this sort of a process. We need to have yes. officers at the table. We need to have yes. more of a community conversation, mm -hmm. listen to our neighborhoods and, and individual citizenry. Um, and so we can we can improve a lot of these things. And, and part of this process is to really just listen to the community. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, uh, a really important piece. And and not to say it's going to move anybody off of the perch that are on right now. Uh, but what it might do is it might elicit some new ideas that are out of the box that will really improve things across mm -hmm. the board that we haven't considered before. Yeah. But we need to have those police folks, men and women at the table. Absolutely. Having the discussion because the person over here complaining may not know what it's really like out there. Apparently many of the city council don't know what it's like out there as yeah, well. I love that you're going okay. out there. And yeah, that, that really makes That's sense. my, yeah. That, Very reassuring that we so have someone. None of the others have been out recently in the last year or so? I don't know. I, I, okay. I wouldn't say that because I honestly don't know okay. what, what they've been doing. Okay. Uh, well, you we're going to ask. Especially with, co with COVID, I'll just tell you, especially with COVID. Yeah. No, I get that. There's I'm a not, lot of disconnect between the council members right now and, yeah. and communication. Well, there's some the communication breakdowns. And all and, that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know what they've been doing. Uh, I really do hope that they, they also, if they haven't in the past, that they are, that they are you know, going out and, yeah, and yeah, seeing this for themselves. Okay. Yeah. There's another topic on the agenda. <laughs> yes. Big one. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Fluoride in the in drinking water. Um, yes. I know that's been a big topic uh, for the city council. Uh, what's kind of your take or things that you guys are trying to implement with that? Yeah. With you know, I, f this is a really difficult issue. I think what you have are two sides that are incredibly well-meaning. I, I think that both want what's best for them, their families, and the rest of the community at large. But I think it's a lot of talking past each other yeah. mm -hmm. and perhaps not the best strategy in terms of how to help everybody in our community in the most efficient and effective way possible. So- uh, But Michael, we've had three elections, three votes yeah. on this. Yes. It's not like the people haven't spoken. We've, we've had three separate elections over a couple of decades. Uh, they've all failed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was a fourth attempt to put this on a ballot that could not qualify for the ballot. They couldn't okay. get enough signatures. And I think those are really important things to consider as we look at this, as we look at doing this councilmatically. Um, if in fact, the will of the community, the will of the voters has changed, 
then we should be putting it before them to make this decision make a case. and not make it for okay. them. I mm -hmm. firmly believe that. Yeah. In fact, of all things, I never thought in my life I would, I would get a letter from Ralph Nader. Okay, but Ralph yeah. Nader sent a letter to the council and the mayor, and I think he's, I don't, I don't want to speak for him. It seems to me he's a little, um, you know, not quite convinced on the issue of fluoride, but even in his letter, he suggested that our community should be voting on this and not doing it councilmatically. Now, should we listen to somebody back in DC and what we do in Spokane? Probably not per se, but I thought that was a very interesting That's perspective interesting. Yes. to get that from, from Ralph Nader of all, of all people. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, you don't even know who Ralph Nader no. is. <laughs> He's nodding my head and smiling. To go back to the year 2000 uh, yeah. presidential election. Yeah. There you go. And before You'll... that, look up Volkswagens. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh my yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. When I was so, about your age. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so on this topic, I mean, there's yes. what's been frustrating to me. And, and look, I, when I ran for office last year, nobody asked me about fluoride. Nobody told me that we should be implementing fluoride. That never mm -hmm. came up. So. I don't feel like I can properly represent my constituents when it wasn't an issue I ran on and it wasn't an issue they asked me to run on. Yeah. Uh, so that's a concern I have just inherently. Right. I also have ethical concerns with uh, informed consent. You know, should we be, and the FDA and others, they, mm -hmm. they agree, this yeah. is a medicine. It's, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a medicinal, yeah. uh, for medicinal purposes. So should we be putting a medicine in the water? Um, and I think that's certainly an ethical consideration that we have to be talking about. And I don't feel like we've discussed that enough from a, from a medical ethical perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, what I have done uh, with the help of my, my assistant, uh, Shay, we went through and we have done just an abundance of research. And I'll tell you, I've, I've learned more and yet know very little about fluoride. <laughs> but I have learned more about fluoride in the last two weeks than I ever thought I would, would yeah, and yeah. would ever care to. Uh, and what I have discovered is there is so many competing and countering studies out there right. that show different things. From what I can see, fluoride, when it is topically applied, is incredibly effective at preventing cavities. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Right. Topically applied. When you ingest it, from what I've seen, there are a number of studies that show that uh, it, the efficacy is, is reduced, uh, but also that uh, there are perhaps with younger um, uh, kids or expectant parents uh, that there could be some implications with regard to IQ. And a frustration I have is just the lack of discussion from us, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a chemical engineer, but the lack of discussion that we have had regarding the specific science of those studies that find these conclusions that mm -hmm. are pretty negative. Uh, what we did was we put together through this research a list of, we stopped at 49 questions, frankly, because of time. I, I probably could have added a number more, uh, but it was taking us a considerable amount of time to put these questions together that were sourced with, with citations. Yeah. And I put this on my Facebook page, I, I released it to the media, and I as well released it to our council staff. And I said, look, these are questions I have regarding fluoride that I think I need to have answered uh, before I even wanna take a vote on mm -hmm. the issue. Uh, I've, I've had a few answers to those, not directly, indirectly through some information I've learned. And those, those, those questions, which you can again view on my Facebook page, uh, I think it's Councilman Michael Cathcart is my, the, the Facebook uh, name if you wanna look it up and take a look at these questions. But they run the gambit from uh, the just sort of general, you know, what is fluoride, how, how is it processed? Because it is a byproduct of aluminum and fertilizer. Yeah. And so I have questions about that. Um, yeah. and, and then I have questions around cost. So the reason this is coming up right now, and I don't know how we are on time. I hope we have a couple more minutes. Yeah, you're yeah. good. Go ahead. But the questions that are coming up right now are uh, uh, around, you know, so, or the, excuse me, the reason this is coming up right now is because an organization of, of kind of activists and some, some folks on the medical side of things have decided that now is the time for whatever reason that they think Spokane needs uh, fluoride, and I think COVID a little bit is playing into this, uh, but they have suggested that they will pay up to $4 million for the implementation of fluoride. Well, according to our water department, they have no true sense of what the cost is going to be, but their sort of baseline estimates are that it could be $6 million or more. So that's a delta of about $2 million mm -hmm. uh, that, that rate payers would have to make up, or, or taxpayers, depending on how we want to pay for it. Um, and then there's probably an operating cost of around six hundred thousand dollars a year for this program. Okay. Again, ratepayers or taxpayers are going yeah, to have to pay that for bill. it. 
So what I have asked as part of my, my list of questions uh, that I put out there was, will, will this organization commit to paying 100% of the cost, not just 4 million? Mm -hmm. Will they commit to paying 100% of those operating costs uh, so that no ratepayer or taxpayer has to foot the bill for this? Uh, and I think that's really important. But what I have seen from some of the grant documents that have been released uh, is that no, they they are only going to commit up to four million at this point. And in fact, if we withdraw from fluoridation because the community changes its mind, the science changes, whatever, yeah. um, in uh, less than twenty years from now, every year less than that we we pull out they will um, essentially expect a, a reimbursement of about 5% per year. So if we only do this for 10 years, then they're gonna want 50% of their money back and et cetera. So that's a concern to me. Uh, this happened in Port Angeles. Uh, I understand where they did this councilmatically. Uh, and in fact, a number of their mem council members were unelected after they did it councilmatically because I think the voters there wanted to say, uh, but the, the folks that were helping to pay for it wanted a reimbursement of those month, yeah. of those dollars. And so, so they followed through. Yeah. yeah. So that's a concern I have yes. in Spokane. And how is that going to impact us fiscally? And then there are just so many scientific questions I have, because again, yes, is there, is there evidence that it does help with cavities? Absolutely. But, but there's other things too, that are related to tooth decay that I've yet to see data on. And in fact, we had a, uh, uh, a forum last week to talk about fluoride, which was which was great that we had this. It was too short, not enough time for questions, but I'm glad at least it was something that right. that virtual. I didn't, I didn't think we would have originally. Yeah. yeah. And I asked the question. I said, so since we have banned uh, smoking in public places, right. have we in Spokane done a study to see uh, what the improvement of that or not uh, related to tooth decay? Because there are studies that say mm -hmm. that secondhand smoke even. Uh, impacts tooth decay. Wow. So have we done studies to look and at that? And we know a host of other issues. That oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the other thing too. There's another study that shows that, you know, folks, and I, this isn't disparaging, it's just, it's, it's in the science. 75% of, of low income uh, individuals tend to drink a sugary beverage daily. Yes. Well, sugary beverages mm -hmm. obviously have a big impact on tooth decay as well yeah, as other health, health factors. Right. Uh, and so have we looked at all of those to say, okay, it is in fact, uh, fluoride that is causing issues that some of our, our dentists in our community are, are concerned about. And it's not these other factors. I, I want data. I, I don't want anecdotal. I don't want suggestions. Right, right. I want specific data, science studies. I want all of that before I'm going to vote on something that again, I have seen science that suggests it could have a negative impact on the IQs of children. Well, take it to the public so, and have public debates. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, what better yeah. can is we have than, than those of us who vote rather than a group of six or seven decide, make, sure. make that decision when it's already been voted down. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, and, and I, I think you're right. I mean, more discussion, more discussion. Yeah. There is no emergency, and that's the other piece yes. that I want to point out here yeah. is that this is being run as an emergency ordinance, which I have said for months and months. In fact, I'm on the record publicly at a few of our meetings concerned about the overuse of emergency ordinances. And the reason I'm concerned about that yes. is that it eliminates the mayor's ability to veto. And there are instances in the past where uh, something has passed with five votes and uh, the mayor can still veto. It's typically symbolic if it passes mm -hmm. with five votes, but right. the mayor can veto. But there are examples where a council member has changed their mind yeah. and the veto stuck. Yeah. So in this instance, that would not be an option. It also eliminates the ability for the public, the community to run a referendum and put this on the ballot. And we have seen uh, a couple of times in history where an issue is so big and so impactful that the community rallies together and in 30 days they can collect the signatures and put it on a ballot. And we the people don't have a voice then. And the, the people do not have a yeah. voice when you do it as an emergency ordinance. And so there are some, I, I think, some legal concerns. I can't get into that because it's attorney-client privilege with our city attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but those have been brought up. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just think we should do this with a better process, a more deliberative process, a more thoughtful process. And frankly, I think the best result would be to put it on a ballot and let the community yeah. have their voice heard exactly. uh, in this. Because again, there, there was some questions around it with our, uh, the mayor's race and the council president race last year. And then they're on the record. Uh, I think the, the mayor had said that she wasn't in favor. I think the council president last year, and this is in an Inland article recently, so I'm not putting words in his mouth, had said that he supported fluoride, but thought it should go to a ballot. And that was last year. So, yeah. so I, I think, you know, so what has changed for this urgency? Perhaps the grant money. Yeah. But, yeah. but again, if you look at the grant documents I've seen, it shows that this grant is good until next year. 
Yeah. Um, so there is no urgency and a need to vote for it on September 14th, which is the current plan date. We need to have you back to talk about that document that you won't share publicly, <laughs> okay? I can't, I would love no, to. No, 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 no. I am all about transparency no, and transparency yeah, is no, my okay. big deal. But, but that's I'm going to become public in a, yeah. in a few weeks. Yes. Okay, Yeah. we need to have you back then. I would love to. speak to all of that, yeah. okay? And we'll, we'll spend a considerable amount of time doing that. Yeah, that would so, be great. So, I'd, yeah. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Michael. Absolutely. I really appreciate you and your intake. It's definitely nice to hear what's happening yeah. within our city. Yeah, anytime. Uh, happy to come and talk. And, uh, so you're yeah, not going to wait another year? <laughs> if you invite me, I'm, I'm here. You're invited Two anytime. Invite me every week and I'm here every okay, week. Okay, you'll... Cool. All right. You heard it here first. Thank <laughs> you so much. That's all the time we have here on the Pulse of Spokane. I'm your host, Ryan Meza. This is Kent Adams. Thank you so much. Governor Inslee's edicts are not saving lives. They're killing businesses. How is it possible that in a nine acre park, I cannot have anybody here in a safe manner? Our employees are healthy. All our guests have been healthy. And the only thing unhealthy with this situation is Governor Jay Inslee's overreaching arm to shut us down. And that is what we're fighting for, to overrule a government that is trying to take over the lives of American citizens for their own benefit, for their own plans. We believe every person is created in the image of God with immeasurable beauty and worth that people should not be defined by their present condition or past mistakes. We are all broken. We need each other. Healing for our brokenness begins with connection, with understanding how much we are loved by a good God. And with healing comes change the potential for joy and meaning. No one was created for mere survival on the streets, for an existence blurred by mind-numbing substances. Each person is created with a purpose, a unique gift no one else can offer the world. Our job is to help them rediscover it. Real people, real change. Union Gospel Mission. Thanks for watching. Ask the host a question, recommend a guest, or check out any of our other programs on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or SpokaneTalksMedia.com. Sponsored by Local 29 Firefighters Union, Well-Dressed Walrus, and Homes for You.